tomorrow. Um, I'm looking forward to speaking to everyone today a little bit. I do recognize that I am the last person sitting between you and lunch. So I will uh, be very efficient with our time here. Um, we are not yet loaded with the presentation, okay? Um, today I'm going to talk about the other side of containers. Uh, Alexis spent the time talking about what the market drivers are for the adoption of containers um, and the evolution of cloud native applications and the macro factors that are going into um, driving this adoption of containers on the application platform side. But uh, for all the talk about containers, it's almost always associated with developers. Uh, it's about improving development, giving developers choice, um, and basically enabling more efficient development of software. And oftentimes, uh, this uh, hype and uh, drive to adopt containers is confused with making the lives of developers easier. And I'd like to go much earlier in the cycle and talk about how uh, development and developers are evolving and how containers are going to have an impact on their lives at that early stage. Um, a bit about myself. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of a technology company called CodeNV. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end here. Uh, I'm also an investor. Uh, I invest only in middleware and uh, development-related businesses. Uh, I'm on the board of Sauce Labs, uh, a few others, and investor in WSO2 as well. I've uh, been involved in the company since 2010, so about half of its existence here. Uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate to work with some uh, fantastic people. Uh, uh, on my board is Byron Sebastian. He was the CEO of Heroku, and he was an EVP at uh, Salesforce.com. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the market here. So um, I'd like to talk about what I call the application trinity. So there are three components to building a cloud-native application. Um, we most often think about, in this room, the platform that's going to host those applications or run the application. Um, it could be your infrastructure provider, your storage solution. It could be your middleware provider, uh, whatever that technology is. But you need a test environment, a production environment, a uh, pre-production environment. And that's on the far right. Now, in order to build applications at cloud scale, we've realized that we need to eliminate all the friction in our development processes. And in order to eliminate that friction, we have to reduce errors. And we've learned that to do things continuously, uh, we've developed this methodology around DevOps. And that is really a system for continuously delivering your applications. And uh, every organization on the planet is now rapidly pursuing some sort of DevOps initiative, and that's the thing in the middle. And you've got this very complicated process there where you start after the developer has committed the code, and then you have to take that code, run it through a whole series of stages um, that involve rebuilding it, packaging it, running unit tests and system integration tests, and ultimately getting through some sort of user acceptance and into production. And the goal here is to do this in a completely automated way, humanless way. And this is a really hard problem. And we're adopting technologies from vendors that are from over 100 vendors around the planet who are trying to get into your system to help you provide this automation so that in theory you can continuously deliver. Now, all of this work begins after the developer has finished, after he's committed his code and it goes into this system. And we don't spend that much time talking about the earliest phase, which is what is your platform for actually authoring these applications, right? This is the developer's domain. Now, we think about, we know some of these tools. There's issue management like Jira uh, from Atlassian. Uh, you've got your source code repo, so GitHub, CollabNet are providing the repositories where the source code is there. And I'm sure everybody's heard of an IDE, an integrated development environment, which is the tools that developers use to actually author the code. 
And there's this fifth component down there called the workspace. Um, and we never really talk about that, but the workspace is this interesting environment, and it's actually a platform itself that helps developers author these apps. Right? So if we want to adopt all these principles about agility, time to market, being highly iterative in our development, you're going to only be as fast as which the team can author the code that's there. So what's happening? Right, what is this developer workspace? We, we oftentimes talk about the IDE, um, and there are lots of tools, lots of fantastic tools on the far left um, that have grown in adoption. And uh, Alexis said there was 10 to 50 million developers. There are actually 22 million professional developers around the world. There's another 40 million hobbyists. So we're right at 62 million developers. Um, it's growing pretty tremendously. There are hundreds of editors that developers use to write their code. Now, what's interesting is that the process of development itself is a very repeatable process. Um, there is a workspace. This is where the code is going to live. And there's some sort of configuration phase to that workspace. And then once it's configured, the developer gets into this crazy developer cycle. Right, where they go edit the code, they rebuild it, they run it to see what their changes did, and they repeat this, and they repeat it endlessly over and over and over again up to hundreds of times an hour until the code works as they spec it out, at which point they can commit it, and then they transition it from their workspace to whatever other system that's there. So they can commit the code, they can deploy it directly, they can push it, they can sync it, and it goes out to your targets that are there. In order for this highly iterative environment to work, there's all sorts of things that the workspace needs to do just right for the developer. It, one, needs to be integrated with the rest of the tool chain. So your source code repository, it's got to be integrated with um, your issue management so you understand what issues you're working on, your continuous integration system, if you've got code quality tools. So there's a number of things that need to be integrated there. The workspace itself is also a platform, it's an environment, so it has to be managed much like your applications do. You've got CPU, storage, memory, I.O., and all those resources need to be brought to bear so that the developer can actually compile the code, he can run it, he can debug it, potentially do it at scale. So there are security issues, there are isolation issues, and on top of that, you have to deal with the packaging and dependencies. So all this stuff comes together onto a workspace. And we don't really talk much about this, but this is essentially the developer's domain. And when you give a developer a project, a single issue, they go into this process of setting up this workspace, wiring up their tools, wiring up the rest of their tool chain, and then moving on and uh, connecting that with their targets. So the reality is, is that Developers today configure their workspaces using something that looks like a wiki. So a developer joins a project, um, or maybe he wants to contribute to an open source project, and along the way he's told, hey, uh, you need to contribute to something, and he points to a wiki page, and there's a list of 40 or 50 steps that the developer has to go through in order to set up their workspace. Now their workspace is traditionally done on their desktop or their laptop. Right, so it's a local host workspace, and so they're essentially configuring um, their environment. Uh, this is kind of crazy and ridiculous because if we're talking about continuous delivery, which is automating everything, um, the one thing that is not automated is what the developer is doing every day on every issue that they're working on. Uh, the analogy here is if Andreessen Horowitz says that software is eating the world, uh, which it is, then in this analogy we are at somewhat of war, and in this war programmers are our fighter jet pilots. But if programmers are the fighter jet pilots, um, there are studies that show that they're spending up to 50% of their time as mechanics on the plane. Right? All this work here is tinkering around with the plane as opposed to flying. Um, this problem is so significant that there was some uh, 100 billion um, hours of wasted time and compute last year 
from developers around the world who are spent tinkering around with their computers as opposed to writing code. Um, if you're doing all this work on your desktop, uh, you want your desktop to be fully utilized for either editing the code, compiling it, or running it. Everything else that you're doing is kind of um, peripheral to the core need. And so it's creating friction and barriers to actually delivering software faster. And so uh, this 100 billion hours of, of lost time would actually equate to approximately $5 billion of annual revenues on Amazon. So as a collective industry, our developers are wasting about $5 billion a year right now um, that they could have spent in a more effective way of authoring their code. So containers. Uh, I think Alexis did a great job of kind of summarizing what a container is about. Uh, containers and developers are always linked together. Um, can containers improve developer productivity? There is this kind of um, hype curve associated with containers that if you give a container to a developer that somehow he's going to be a lot more productive. But there are some interesting problems um, that show up as a result of this. Now the first thing is, is that on a technical level there are really six interesting qualities of a container that matter to developers. Um, uh, one, speed. These things boot in milliseconds, right? If VMs boot in seconds, these are measured in nano and milliseconds that's there. Which means that if you can boot an entire computer in milliseconds, you can essentially provision a set of resources instantly that are usable by developers for a variety of things. Uh, the second thing is, is that uh, they're recipe driven. And so uh, the containers themselves, when they're created, uh, you can create them according to a recipe that is a text file. That text file can be saved in version, which means that you can create the same container over and over and over again, and it's going to be identical each and every time. Um, and so that creates repeatability. Uh, there's command injection, so that once these containers exist, it's easy for... Um, you to execute something inside the container if you're on the outside of it. So you can take commands from one location and inject them into the container that's running somewhere else. And this has a unique property that's beneficial to developers. Um, isolation is a big deal so that the developer can work on two issues at the same time, put them into separate containers, and they'll be isolated from each other. Right? As opposed to having a single desktop where they're trying to do a bunch of things at the same time and all of it kind of mixes and blends together in an unhelpful way. They're networked, and I'll talk about what that means, and they're snapshotable, which means that they can be saved and reused with their state without being lost. So, what does this mean? Well, when you put all those qualities together, right, in addition to being a very interesting hosting uh, building block, Containers are actually ideal as service providers for repetitive tasks for the developers. Because it boots so fast, remember that edit, build, run cycle that a developer does hundreds of times? Well, because these things are so fast, you can actually use containers to scale out the developer process in ways that they can't do on their local host. Um, one other problem that is introduced here is that uh, containers, while being advocated as a developer-centric solution, are really a DevOps solution. The operations guys are in love with this. And the reason being is that today, what happens with most organizations is that the software developer writes code in terms of uh, files and folders and libraries. They commit it into the repo, and then they go to their DevOps guy and say, now it's your problem. And the DevOps guy spends his entire day figuring out how to write a continuous integration logic or policy to take all that code that's been committed in and then to transform it into a structure that can be deployed. Right? And so he's got to figure out how it's going to run on his various environments. And this mapping is really difficult. Right? And he spends a lot of time, and when something goes wrong, he doesn't really know whether it's the operations team or it's the developer, because the formats that these uh, people work in are very different. So containers, the ops guys are all excited by this, and particularly the CI guy, because now the container comes along, and the CI guy goes, you know what, Mr. Developer, it's your problem. All I want for you is I want you to check in the container, 
you develop your code, you develop your files, but I want the container, and then I'll take your container, reconfigure it a little bit, and put it in production. Here, so my life is way easier. I just my input's a container, my output's a container. Life's grand for me. But now, what we did is we just shifted the burden of this figuring out the configuration all the way up higher up the stack, so that the developers who understand files and folders and modules are now being told make it work with containers as well. And and that's not a straightforward challenge, right? So how does the developer maintain this mapping? How do they figure it out? Um, IDEs, editors, uh, the existing tools that are on the market today do nothing to help the developers solve this problem. Um, this problem gets a little bit more compounded because the developer is now responsible for dealing with composition. Um, we talk about containers. Uh, the purpose of containers is to create as much modularity in your application as possible. But let's take uh, a very simple example, you, you know, imagine you're building an application that has three tiers. It's a web tier, an app tier, and a database tier. Um, what's the right packaging of this for the developer? Uh, on the one hand, if you're going to try to write as much code as possible, you want to take all three of these things and put them in one container. You have one container, you boot it, you shut it down, it's pretty simple, you write your code and you repeat, 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 repeat. Um, but in an enterprise environment, that may not be plausible. Right? Your database may be on a central system shared by everybody. So you might need one container with your web tier and your, um, your, your middleware, and then you have to configure that connect to connect to the shared data storage. Or in another environment, you say, well, we really want to test total distribution of this, so what we want to do is have three containers, one for the, the, the client, one for the middleware, one for the database, and we want each developer to repeat this over and over again. So now you have to coordinate them all, sequence their boot, wire them together, um, and this will vary by team or by environment, and it gets to be, you know, really a problem. So, so this whole, you know, how many containers and how are they wired together is a composition issue. And so this is where technologies like Docker Compose, um, Kubernetes Pods, there's no standards yet here, but there are emerging, very competitive technologies that are attempting to simplify this mapping of containers that are usable for both developers and operations professionals in a structured way in text files that are here. So, again, this is just a burden that's getting pushed up to the developer. So, um, containers, great. Right? Offer lots of promise. Um, I'm in a company uh, that's involved with taking containers and using containers to make the lives of the developer much more efficient. Uh, we actually believe that the configuration of the workspace is the biggest inhibitor to the delivery of software applications. Uh, we spend so much time focused on the downstream portions of the workflow, uh, there's not a lot of attention paid to the lives of developers themselves. Uh, what we make is uh, we make a developer workspace cloud. Uh, it provisions workspaces. Um, it makes them easy to manage, uh, very simple to share. They are sandboxed and secure, and it will work with any IDE. Uh, we provide a web-based IDE embedded in the product for those that don't have it, or you can connect your own IDEs. Um, and essentially what this does is it makes the workspace repeatable, shareable, scalable um, to any size and compliant for your legal teams. Uh, we offer this uh, technology in, in two ways. Uh, we have a SaaS offering, which is self-service. Um, uh, we have almost 200,000 users uh, with our self-service offering and about 400,000 projects. People can just log on and develop online. Uh, or we have an on-prem offering. Um, our on-prem offering is integrated uh, very tightly with WSO2. Uh, and it's workspaces that run behind your firewall. You manage them yourselves. And uh, you can customize it as you see fit. And all of this technology is based upon open source standards. Uh, a project called Eclipse Chain, which is both an SDK and a cloud IDE uh, for creating extensions. And it's supported by some great companies. Uh, WSO2 is a committer. Uh, and contributor to that project as well. And they're working to embed it inside of all their server products 
so that every server product from WSO2 will have an embedded developer workspace that launches on demand, so the developer no longer has to configure anything. They just click, open up, do their customizations, and they're committed and available as part of that. Um, a couple of unique qualities about how we're using containers to do it. Uh, first, what we do is we've taken that workspace and we break it down to its atomic parts. And so each of these things that the developer does, like edit, build, run, refactor, syntax analysis, these are each microservices that run within our environment. And those microservices are powered by machines, which are Docker containers. And so what allows for is a developer can use any tool, uh, perform any number of functions, and those functions are backed by an elastic, horizontally scalable set of nodes. And so essentially a developer can stress the system to its infinity and never run out its resources, all in a non-thrashing, non-blocking way. Uh, so it becomes highly customizable and much more scalable. Uh, we automate the typical workflows. Uh, we'll, we'll give, I'm going to be in another couple sessions and, and can give some demos of that as well. But uh, we, we take those common workflows around contributing to a project, setting up the environment so that in under 30 seconds you can take a multi-tiered application and have a fully functioning workspace that you can make a contribution to. Um, all of this is based upon a highly extensible a framework called Eclipse Che. Uh, Eclipse Che is a system that allows you to create a customized workspace that is white labeled uh, for your own. Um, there's, there's any number of different technologies and, and there's about uh, 50 or so committers on the project worldwide that are working on it on a full time basis there. Um, our stack uh, is based upon uh, Eclipse Che. We essentially take these customizations and create this elastic workspace cloud. Uh, I'm happy to uh, share more about our company for those who are interested here. But uh, I'm going to wrap up, let you guys get to lunch early here. Uh, I really appreciate you all coming out uh, to the conference. Uh, I'm very excited to be here in London. I'm going to be spending time in all the sessions for the next two days, and I'm happy to do some Q&A. But I hope you guys have a fantastic event, and I hope that you're all considering containers in your own unique way and that the technology services you well. Thank you very much.